about two minutes if you can all take your seats and get ready to get settled. And we would ask that you each be seated so we can see how many have their seats ready. Welcome to the Muscatine Community School Board Candidates Forum. We are in the City Council Chambers at Muscatine City Hall. I thank the city for opening this space to us tonight. We are live on Channel 2 and 702. I'd like to welcome all those citizens viewing from other venues and the audience here in attendance. There are five seats open, four seats for a four-year term and one seat for a two-year term. Karen Cooney, John DeBeat, Mike Morgan, Dennis Schur, Ricky Teed, and Mary Wildermuth are running for a four-year term. Aaron Finn and Jeff Osborne are running for a two-year term. Please help us welcome our candidates. It's all right. Did I miss someone? Miss Nate. Sorry. Right. Nathan, so sorry. I'm used to it. <laughs> and Nathan's running for a four year term. That's right. Let's welcome him too. <laughs> so I am Jackie McCoy, and I'm a member of the Muscatine County League of Women Voters, and I will be moderating the event this evening. The League of Muscatine uh, Women Voters of Muscatine County feels really privileged to be able to host this forum. And the League of Women Voters is composed of women and men to form an organization that encourages you, the voters, to be informed and actively participate in government. The League does not support any particular candidate. However, the League influences public policy through education and advocacy. Through voter service activities, information on candidates and election issues are provided and voter participation is promoted. This forum is a voter service event. Our candidates night is a chance to learn more about the people running for school board positions. We hope that tonight's forum is beneficial to voters and selecting candidates when you go to the polls to vote on November the 5th. So I will begin tonight events with giving each candidate time to introduce themselves and tell you why they are running for a seat on the school board. Each question will have a rotation of who speaks first. Time limits will help us move the evening along and league members will distribute and collect cards with questions from the audience for later. So let's begin. In our first questions, candidates will have two minutes to give a personal information about themselves. Why are you running and what's your primary goal to improve the Muscatine Community School District? Do I start? I'm gonna do Karen, okay. starts. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jackie, and the League of Women Voters for arranging the forum. Knowledge is power. You may hear me say that a time or two tonight. 
I graduated from Muscatine High in 1973. In fact, that was the year that the old bridge was blown up. I went to MCC for a year, and then I took a little bit of time off. At age 25, I spent my time in LA, taking and going to school there, where I was a DJ in the, the radio station that we had there. Uh, I also was able to do some missionary work down the Baja Peninsula area where I got to see families live in adobe brick homes that had tires for windows. That humbled me. It showed me that it does not matter where you're at. Education is so important. Everybody deserves it no matter where they are. Knowledge is power. First I job I graduated after University of Iowa was JTPA. Then recently after I retired, Tired after 32 years of working for HUD programs as the family self-sufficiency program as well as I was manager for Hershey Manor and then Sunset Park. Now I can tell you that if I can read that fine little print on the HUD federal regs, I can easily read anything that has to do with school board policy and the budgets itself. Knowledge is power. And so after I retired, what I did, I decided to become a substitute school teacher. With that, I learned a lot of valuable lessons and hope to share with you some of those tonight. Education goals, the right fit for each one of the kids. Society goals, solution for kids not to stay as being bullies. Instead, they learn to be productive adults. And emotional goals for a solution for the kids that were bullies so they no longer are traumatized. Teacher goals. Include more training for sub-teachers and para-educators. Knowledge is power. So let's get these solutions started for our kids and our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. John? Well, good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Jackie, and thank the League of Women's Voters for sponsoring this event. Also, I would like to thank my family, my wife, Abir, and my two uh, boys, my twin boys, uh, Nabil and uh, Anton. Uh, it, as uh, Karen said, no, uh, education is knowledge, or knowledge is education. I would say education is my career. I spent 29 years teaching at a college level, and I'm still currently a teacher. So uh, that's very important for me. Education is uh, very important for me, for my whole entire family. Um, I'm the chair of the business department at MCC, and also I teach economics and statistics. I was elected to serve on school board four years ago, and I knew from day one that serving on a school board here in Muscatine is a good and great fit for me as an educator. I made a promise that the first year I will be visiting every building and talking to everyone in every building. And guess what? I did it many times. I visited every building. I spoke to teachers. I spoke to students. I spoke to staff. I spoke to principals and all over. Uh, why I'm running? Again, because education is my career. That is the first point that I would like to say. What else? I do have two kids in the school system. This is another reason why I would like to run again and get the other, a second chance to continue the work that I started to do four years ago. I do believe that the best investment that each one of us can make is investing in education, in our school system, because our students today are our leaders tomorrow. So it is very important that every kind of job that our teachers are doing the staff, the school board, everybody are playing a very good job. So for that reason, I'm still undecided to run for re-election. Nathan? Thank you, Jackie. Also, thank you to everyone who's here tonight, the League of Women Voters, everyone who's tuning in, and everyone who will ultimately, hopefully, watch this uh, later on. Uh, my name's Nathan Mather. Uh, this is uh, I've served two terms on the school board. I'm a Muscatine native, uh, born and bred. For a little while, I followed my girlfriend out to the East Coast, and I lived there, and I, I worked in New York and at a big law firm and, and in New Jersey and did all that stuff. I've lived uh, in different places throughout the world, and I came back to Muscatine. And the reason for that is this is the best place in the world to be. Muscatine is and should be the best, and that's why I'm running, because I truly believe we can be the best. 
Uh, I mentioned that I've been on for two terms. In my first term, uh, I got onto the board uh, not really knowing what the heck was going on. And, and actually, I don't think I was alone. There was a lot of chaos back then. Muscatine's curriculum was not aligned. We had innovation that was going off in different directions. And, and people didn't really know what was happening. Our finances were in a mess. So we spent the first four years turning all that around. Um, in my second term, we began to start building after having cleared the rubble. We worked on aligning the curriculum, expanding opportunities for children, and um, basically uh, dealing with issues where they arose. The goal was to put systems in place that we can build on in the long term. And that's why I'm here, because it is time now to achieve mastery. It takes a long time to turn a big ship, and I think that we have reached the point where we can finally turn that ship now. It's been a difficult journey, but I think it's been a rewarding one, and it is one that I'm confident that I want to see through to the end. I would ask for your support uh, because we can be great. We can be the best, and that is my vision. We are not there yet. We have a lot of work to do, but we have the resources and the uh, people in this district to be truly one of, if not the best, school in this state. That is my goal, and I will not rest until we have achieved being the best. Thank you. Mike? Uh, I want to say thank you also to the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight. Uh, I'm Mike Morgan. I'm recently retired administrator with the district and current business partner with Fighting Chance Solutions here in Muscatine. Uh, I have many educational experiences that I think are pertinent to this, this position. I'm a 1981 graduate. I have a master's degree in effective teaching and a master's degree in administration. Both those are from Drake University. I have a PK-12 administrative experiences both in the public and non-public schools. Uh, and within our school district, I've served as a teacher. Besides serving as an administrator, I've also served as a teacher, a coach, a paraprofessional, and even as a sub-custodian. Uh, I think though what I'm most proud of is the fact that I have four Muscatine High School graduates. My wife and I, Mar my wife Mary and I take our, our parenting very seriously. Um, and I think that that's, that's why it, I'm, I'm proud of them. And what that does is that really ties to what my philosophy of education is. And that's the fact that I believe that parents are the primary educators of their kids. And with that, I believe it's when I was working, it was always my belief that it was my obligation to seek out what the parents wanted or what they needed, and then to try to do the best that I could to support that ability. I also believe that in what John Hattie pointed out, some of the research that John Hattie pointed out, and that that's teachers, not programs, make a difference. They have the greatest impact on student learning. Um, we need to hire and train the best teachers that we possibly can, and then allow them to teach. So what I bring to the table in this is an open mind, uh, an ability to work with people and to create a common and common support or common vision and support that that vision. And I'm not coming into this election with any preconceived notion that I know all the answers because I've just recently been there. Um, I don't. <laughs> I got the stop sign. Other. Thank so. you, <laughs> Dennis. I'd like to thank uh, Jackie and the League of Women Voters also. Uh, my name is Dennis Shure, and I've been married for 41 years. Uh, Lynn and I have two daughters, Krista and Kara. I'm a retired school teacher after 33 years of service. 29 of those years were in the Muscatine Community School District. My first four years of experience, I was at Central Middle School, and then uh, the next 25 years, I finished up at West Middle School teaching computer education classes. I also was the varsity softball coach in Mus for Muscatine High School for, the, for 26 years. I'm running for the school board because my two daughters attended Muscatine Community School District and I feel they, they received an outstanding education. I now have grandchildren attending elementary school in the district and I want to help them continue uh, the excellence my daughters received. A couple of goals I have for the Muscatine Community School District are maintaining uh, manageable class sizes for the teachers and uh, also developing ways to uh, help improve our facilities, to attract new families. Uh, we have a great a number of businesses here and we, when we get uh, incoming people, we want those families to be living in Muscatine so we can uh, educate their, their students. 
Through my experiences, I can relate to all levels of the education experience as system. I was a teacher, a coach, an MEA member, contract maintenance representative, union negotiator, parent, and now a grandparent. Because of these distinct qualities, I believe I can be an asset to the teachers and the administration of this school district. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? <clears throat> I'm Ricky Teed, and thank you for everyone to par that are, is participating today. I am a parent of five kids. The oldest one's 12. And so I have many children that are coming up through the ranks right now. And I have a great desire to see that they have an excellent education here in Muscatine. I grew up here, I graduated high school here, and I went to the U of I, and I've recently returned back to Muscatine five years ago. I, I love this community, and I know that we have great potential here in this community and within the school system. And right now, my concerns are that it is below average on the statewide level, and so I, my hope is that we will be able to turn that around and, and be one of the top schools here in the state of Iowa so that our kids can have an excellent education and be able to, to thrive in, in this life. And I know that if we get the right pieces to the puzzle in place, we will be able to do that. We have tremendous, tremendous assets here with the teachers, and if we can let them teach, um, they will do excellent. And if we can let them bring forward their concerns and improvements, then we'll be able to address those individual concerns and, and be able to harness that power that we have throughout the teachers, the paraeducators, and all the support staff. And so my hope is that as a school board member, I'll be able to find those pieces, put them in place, and, and let the people do their jobs and, and teach our children. I know that we can have an excellent school system, and that is my hope as a school board member. Thank you. Mary? Yes, thank you um, very much to the Jackie and to the League of Women Voters. Good evening. I'm Mary Wildermuth, and I'm running for re-election to the Muscatine Community School District Board of Education. I have lived in Muscatine for the last 40 years and retired from the school district in 2010, having been a high school librarian and then working with a variety of teachers, administrators in the community to write grants and oversee many different curricular areas as the district's special project facilitator. I'm running to continue the work that has been begun and help the new superintendent, our schools and our community transition to our next level. We are in the midst of opening an early learning center, closing a middle school, and finalizing a curriculum audit. The curriculum audit will help us determine um, our next steps to academic achievement. The in-depth view will provide our new superintendent with a path to take academically. <clears throat> My goals are, um, I think that we need to collaborate more with the city council, the board of supervisors, board of supervisors and other community bodies to better address together the needs of our community. Uh, we obviously need to maintain our fiscal responsibility. We need to continue to improve student achievement and be the best educational system in the state of Iowa. Uh, we need to continue to be a community leader. The school district needs to be this and is by doing the things that we've done and uh, addressing our long-term growth and visibility in our community viability in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, <coughs> League of Women Voters. I'm Aaron Finn. I'm a current board member and a lifelong res resident and graduate of the Muscatine School District. My wife, our parents, our four children, and eventually our grandson will participate in the school district as well. I think that's five generations, if not possibly six, with our great-grandparents. So we've been around Muscatine for a little while. I'm running because I believe if the next few years is the most important few years of our district for the next decade or two. And we, need, we deserve a school board that will listen and respect all groups within that district 
our parents, our students, the staff, and the administration while working collaboratively and empathetically with those groups to drive the success for our students going forward. The next few years are critical for that long-term future of our district with the results of the curriculum audit that Mary just mentioned and the hiring of the new superintendent. We will be setting the course of our district for the next decade and my goal is to set, help set that course with reasonable, fact-based plan that supports our staff and students and their success in life. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Jeff Osborne and I want to thank Jackie and the League of Women Voters of Mustang County for hosting this event and all the folks that come here and those watching on TV and who will later watch this on TV. Uh, my name, uh, I'm running for school board uh, for the unique learners the, among us. Uh, Mustang schools have, have been working well for about 75% of the population and, uh, and there's, there's no doubt about it, it's working very well for, for many folks. However, we are running, by any measure, we're running a below average in Iowa schools. And the gap comes in unique learners like myself. I grew up in a, in a system a long time ago before, you know, dyslexia was well known, I was undiagnosed, and I felt like uh, uniquely odd. I know most kids feel pretty odd, but uh, the, the learning programs at that time were, were not working for me and I was told to work harder and be like everybody else and it just wasn't working. Um, ultimately, I ended up graduating from Iowa State University with a degree in mechanical engineering and a master's from uh, University of Minnesota. My wife and I moved here roughly four years ago. I came here five years ago to work and then later we decided to move here ourselves. My daughter Hannah attended uh, all of West Middle School and is currently a sophomore in, in the high school. And she is also uh, a unique learner. And I'm running for the, the, the students that are unique learners such as myself. I'm running for the teachers who have unique ideas to, and know their students and, and want to try new things. However, they're locked into a, a system that they, they feel a little constrained and I'm running for frustrated parents, such as my wife and I, that, that have been trying to, to uh, advocate for our unique learners, and I got a stop sign. Thank you. The next question is created by the League of Women Voters. It's a two-part question that was presented to you candidates in advance, so you will only have 90 seconds to answer the question. The question is, we understand that Superintendent Reby will be retiring at the end of this year. What qualities are you looking for in the next superintendent? And how will you engage the community in this process? And we will start with John. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think the first thing that I think of will be, I want to see a strongly committed to student first student first philosophy in all decisions that is very important uh, a step for me obviously i would like to see the superintendent uh, uh, as a strong communicator um, someone who inspired to trust everyone from uh, the teachers to the staff to the support staff uh, i want to see a superintendent that has uh, optimism all the time, even though the job by itself is very hard job. Uh, I want to see someone who's organized and include the community and the school board in making the tough decisions. I want to see a superintendent that have a unique relationship with teachers, because to be honest with you, teachers are the best asset that we have in our district and we need to have that kind of relationship with them. How do I include the community? As I said, I want that superintendent to include and invite the community in every decision and in every step that, uh, that he or she might take. Before that, obviously, we are, as a current board, we will be getting feedback from the community, from organizations and businesses as part of making that final decision. Thank you. Thank you. Nathan? 
Thank you, Jackie. So the most important thing that a superintendent, or the, excuse me, that a school board does is elect a super, or rather hire a superintendent. Uh, and so when you have someone on the school board, that person has a unique opportunity to influence the district for years beyond their tenure on the board. So what do you want in a superintendent? Well, I'll tell you what I want. Number one, the superintendent, he or she has to be able to drive academic performance. As uh, Jeff alluded to, we are not where we need to be academically. And I believe that we have uh, cleared away uh, the things that weren't working, so we have a foundation we can build on, but that absolutely needs to happen. The superintendent needs to understand the importance of the players in the community and how to move between them. And that doesn't just mean the pillars of the community, the businesses, you know, uh, the folks who normally write checks. That means the parent groups, the teachers unions, the churches. Everybody who is in this community has a part to play and the superintendent has to be able to bring them together. And finally, and most importantly, the superintendent has to have a vision for the future. They have to be able to sell that vision. So how would I engage them in the community? I would absolutely, uh, in the introduction stage, bring this person around, help him or her to meet uh, the individuals who are important. I would encourage him or her to go on a listening tour right away and take them in an orientation so that they can meet the people who are involved in this community and who make it tick. But after the introduction, we have to worry about integration. The superintendent needs to work with MCC. Uh, we need to organize local boards for this, uh, and put the superintendent in this role of community involvement, and that does include government and non-governmental organizations. These are the steps that I would take. Thank you. Mike? I believe that uh, <clears throat> Nathan is exactly right. Hiring the next superintendent is going to be crucial to, uh, to where we want to be as a community. And I don't think it's just within our, our school district. I, I do believe it's our community. It's where Muscatine is going to go. Um, and for that reason, I think it's really important for that, for the next superintendent, whether it's a he or she, to have, have the ability to bring together an entire community. And that would be the business leaders, that would be um, the Chamber of Commerce, that would be the City Council. They also have to have the courage to be a disruptor if it's necessary. It, it, will you step forward and take ownership and do what you need to do if you have to face that tough decision? I also think that they need to be able to look at the, the future and how rapidly everything is changing right now and whether that would be to address the, the fact that the testing is a business or the fact that what, what kind of impact does student loan have on, on what we do right now. That's a 15 trillion, I believe it's 15 trillion. I know that the, the student debt right now, would what we have in the United States would be the fifth biggest economy in the world. Um, how would I do this? I think that the Chamber of Commerce and I think the City Council need to have a seat on the hiring pro as part of the pro hiring process. Mm -hmm. I also think that one of the big things that the board needs to do is go out and ask our parents, what do you want? As I said, I believe parents are the primary educators of kids. We need to do that in every way that we possibly can, whether it's with social media, town hall meetings, um, any way that we possibly can do that. I must talk a lot. I can <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Dennis. I'm surprised too. Okay, I, I believe that uh, we must select a candidate who has experience in the demographics, similar to the demographics that we have in Muskegon Community School District. The candidate should have a passion for academics and a background in finances, and who can give a base, who can give guidance based on the current assets that are available. The type of assets I'm talking about are our outstanding teaching staff, our great administrators, and our non-certified staff. They also should be innovative enough to try new programs to, and create a better learning environment for all students. When trying those new programs, the candidate must also be humble enough to admit when they made a mistake and then things have gone wrong and back out of the, that mistake. We've had a, we had a couple instances of that a few years ago in what was called the G2 program that we had to get rid of and do something different. Um, it's imperative that the leadership, that this leadership place a strong value on teachers and principals, and I believe would be better served to have more input from the teachers. Currently, it seems like an undue amount of burden has been placed on the individual school level, and we've uh, began alienating our most important commodity, and that is our teachers and our non-certified staff. How am I going to engage the community in this process? I think that uh, 
I envision a, having community forums before the candidate is, is selected and to find out what the community wants in a, in a superintendent. I also uh, would like to have online surveys for the students, uh, staff, parents, and community members so they could share their insights. Thank you. Ricky? For the superintendent that is going to be hired here soon, there are probably three main things that I'd be looking at beyond a focus and a desire for the students to learn and to succeed. That should obviously be one strong aspect in that. And that would be their ability to work with the teachers, the principals, and create an, an environment where those teachers feel comfortable coming forward because they are on the front lines. They see what's working, what is not working. And if, if those teachers can bring those concerns forward one step at a time, we can make small corrections here and there and, and be able to hopefully continue on, you know, riding the ship and, and trying to bring the school system up to par and, and beyond. And beyond that, they need to be able to work with the MEA. The, the state of Iowa has changed the bargaining units and, and has given a lot more power to the, the administration. And, and those teachers need to feel comfortable in their roles so that they can teach. And, and if the superintendent can work with the, the MEA, then, then hopefully there will be a comfortable environment for the teachers to succeed there and teach our, our children. And also, another extremely important is that vision to, to take us to the next level. And that vision Okay, needs... I'm sorry, but you have to stop. Right, okay. <laughs> All right. Mary? Did you want to finish your thought? Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's okay. <laughs> so the characteristics that I want in a new superintendent are I don't want a white knight. I, want some, I don't want someone who will swoop in and um, look at bringing their programs and change everything. But I want someone who will take us from where we are to where our next phase is. And we already have a couple things in place that would help that person. One would be this curriculum audit. And the other is the infrastructure that we're building with the early learning center and moving to one um, junior high. Now the characteristics of this person, they need to have integrity as an experienced educational leader, somebody who's a good communicator, one who can continue and evolve our vision, a person who likes people. Um, obviously they have to know something about fiscal responsibility. I want them to live in the community and collaborate with a variety of boards and groups to strengthen our schools and our community. And in regard to um, interviewing candidates for superintendent, obviously um, we would include teachers, students, parents, um, as, excuse me, as Mike said, the Chamber of Commerce, pretty much anybody. And I guess tonight, if you want to be on one of those committees, we're getting into that process already, the board that exists is. So if you want to be on that, you know, <coughs> leave your name with somebody so we capture that tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. The next superintendent, I hope, will have a focus on student achievement, the same financial rigor, and a drive to create an open, transparent, and collaborative environment with the staff. My hope is that this superintendent has come from a district with similar characteristics and demographics and has a proven track record of student success. One key component will be the superintendent's ability to engage our community and parents to improve our attendance issue that plagues us at all levels of our district. The new superintendent should also bring an innovative approach to investing in our students' special education and behavioral needs. I would like to, um, I would like to see us take a, invest in those areas to drive more effectiveness throughout our students and our staff. I believe our staff today spend a significant amount of time managing special education and behavioral needs outside of the education environment. And I think we need to overinvest rather than just spend the money we're allotted there. So how I would engage the community for this process is to have them involved in the interviewing process, have them involved in the groups that we are going to put together. We just uh, spent last week hiring a new search firm, and those search firms had some good ideas on mingling 
um, staff and parents into these interview groups and really having a superintendent that has to answer the same question to all of them at the same time. And I believe that'll go a long way to see how this superintendent will actually perform. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff? Characteristics I'd like to see in a superintendent are uh, a strong character, humility, and contagious passion for the job that they're going to be doing. I'd like to see a superintendent who is wary of our, of our history. To Nathan's point, I've read about uh, the financial troubles we had five years or more ago. We need to keep the foundation that's been built over the last five years or more. Uh, we, we can't lose that. Um, we need to, uh, the board five years ago or more was, was torn apart one member, even quit because of some of the infighting that was going on. And so we need somebody that keeps the, the cohesion of the teams together and brings people together. But number one, I want a, a superintendent who puts students, parents, and teachers first. Humility comes in that person that they won't have all the answers, or, that, or they at least they admit they don't, they don't have all the answers, but the, the answers will come from parents, teachers, and students. And for us to break through uh, below average to average and above average in Iowa, we're going to have to get creative. Um, we're gonna have to look beyond the 75% of the population that we do already do very well with, and we're gonna have to start working on the folks uh, that are that are the unique learners, the students that are unique learners, uh, and uh, start wor and work with them in creative ways. These are our future leaders. They're the folks that that break new ground, uh, create new ideas, and um, we can't we can't keep uh, okay. uh, we can't get to greatness without uh, and keep doing the same thing over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> the next, Karen. I'm sorry, Karen. That's okay. You forgot Nathan earlier, so I'm, why not? <laughs> uh, the good, the superintendent is the CEO of the school board. He or she sets the tone, steers the course, the direction it needs to go for the district, and works closely with the school board. A great superintendent, though, has a clear vision, an effective communicator, not afraid, though, of taking any risks, but also a commitment. And yet be flexible because why we have so many different things that can happen in our school system. Here are a couple questions though that I would ask the candidate. Did they recommend changes to the legislature or state department of education to significantly improve ability to provide high quality education? How did the candidate deal with union contracts? Did they successfully implement worthwhile changes to those contracts? How do we engage the teachers and the citizens? We've all mentioned different things. Uh, they're all great ideas. One of the things is, again, with that curriculum is excellent because we've already had folks that have started to take and work on that. So we know that there are teachers and students and citizens that want to be able to be a part of all of that. But we need to work together as a community and listen to each other and communicate well. Teachers should be allowed to teach. Administrators need to be able to do what they need to do, but everybody needs to communicate well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So now we're ready for questions from the audience, and I have a great list here. I do want you to know that some of them have Questions have already been sort of answered in the first question. So, um, and there's many here, but we're just going to answer as many as we can through the time that we have left. So if your question did not get answered, there will be about 20 minutes before the building closes that you can personally come up and talk to the candidates afterwards. So beginning with this question is, due to the high school having such a high population of students, would you even consider moving ninth grade back to the middle school? And we will start with Aaron. I'm sorry, we're actually gonna start with Nathan. That's two times, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Karen feels my pain. You are the popular one now. <laughs> That's right. Could, I, let me just make sure I've got that. Uh, due to the high school having high population, would you consider moving ninth grade back to the middle school? Correct. Well, that's an excellent question. 
it is an excellent question for the next superintendent. See, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what the board does. The board sets policy, and you've had answers from all nine of us on a couple of questions now, and, and hopefully now you start to see the differences that emerge, because we've all said we're, we're four children, we're four students, we're four teachers, we're four academic performance, absolutely. Uh, but the question is whether or not we would move kids back to the middle school, and the answer is I don't know. I would want to talk to the new superintendent. I would like to see the situation play itself out for a year or two, at least so we have a baseline and can know what academic performance is like and how it's affected by the current move that we're anticipating. Uh, the, we can't just simply say, um, we're going to do this right away. That's how we got into some of the problems we had so many years ago uh, in the first place. What we need to do is take careful data-driven steps, carefully analyze how it's working for the students, the parents, the teachers, how it impacts the community. I mean, think about traffic pickup issues at one middle school on Kindler. Uh, that, that would be quite a bit, I think. So the answer is I am absolutely open to the idea, and I think any good board member would be open to the idea. But to tell you that the board member is going to set that kind of policy uh, is, is simply inaccurate. The superintendent is the one who makes those types of recommendations with data, with analysis, and presents it to the board for approval because we rely on him or her to achieve the desire, or to, to uh, reach the achievement that we all desire. And uh, for us to sit here and, and, and uh, recommend changes like that or not, I think simply misses the mark. Thank you. Same question, Mike. <clears throat> I agree with Nathan that the, the superintendent is the one that, that guides that ship. Um, I do think it's important, and it, it's not something that we want to jump into right away. I do think it's important that, again, parents being the primary educators of the kids, we get up to get feedback from them. I think Nathan's also right with the standpoint of we don't know what's going to happen moving to one middle school right now. Um, Denny and I both were at West Middle School. and. I was in school at one time when there were 900 kids in that and there was one-way traffic and there was no expansion to that. It was, not, it was not fun, you know? It was dangerous because you could only move one way. Um, but I think that no matter what happens, I don't think anybody can say yes or no tonight. I wouldn't, I would hope they wouldn't. But I think that the, what we need to do is listen to the parents, listen to why, why do we think that that ninth grade move is happening or needs to happen and consider that and then move forward with the best information that we have. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I totally agree with that, that the superintendent sets the, brings the policy to the board for the board approval or uh, for conversation with the board. And as a board member, I guess I would, I would get um, ideas from the community on what their views are. Um, one thing we have to realize is that our enrollment is declining and so the high school enrollment will be going down in the future. Um, I know with the going into the one middle school, I think they anticipate a two year, um, a two year window where it's gonna be uh, high enrollment in those, in those uh, classes. And, but after that two year window, then the enrollment does go down. So those students will eventually get to the high school and our enrollment will go down. So I would hope that our superintendent, the new superintendent would bring a policy or recommendation to the board and ask for our input. And I would hope that it would also have community forums so that the community would be involved in that decision. Thank you. Ricky? Thank you. Yes, I would like to think that if, if we're presented with this question that the superintendent um, would be able to have the people in place to help make that decision and make an informative decision. There are lots of parts and pieces to every, every decision on the school board level, and no matter how small it might seem, I mean, there's traffic, there's de uh, what are the future uh, demographics gonna look like in, in the student body. And hopefully, you know, when we get a question like this, we take a step back, try to capture everything that might go into that, even if it might seem trivial, and be able to make an informative decision. And it would be a, a difficult one to do, especially with just one middle school and moving three grades into it, making sure that the building size is large enough. I mean, it would be difficult, but we would be able to work with the superintendent and hopefully get an informative decision from him 
so that we can make a good ruling on that. Thank you, Mary. So I would concur with what everybody else has said. I would look at it a little bit differently though, um, as the academic needs of students are different, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, um, uh, working with MCC to do more uh, what we would call career and technical training, and that maybe it wouldn't be necessary, or it isn't necessary to move ninth graders, but to look at moving um, upperclassmen more out into the community, um, to the workplace, or to MCC, or to various programs. Uh, much more of a, um, what I wanna say, non, uh, you, would, you would succeed based on competency, and you would leave the high school sooner to get out and maybe um, become a welder. So I guess I would look at it that way. Thank you, Aaron? Um, yes, the answer is I would consider it, of course. I would consider anything brought thoughtfully to the board by our superintendent, whether it's the current superintendent or the new one. Um, I believe that we have to be able to manage our declining enrollment. It's one thing that I think has worked well over the last four years that I've been on the board. If you look at the infrastructure that we have in place and the way that we've been able to manage that in a financially sound way, we have to continue to do that. And if that means that helping students and moving them from the high school into the middle school is the best path forward, then, then that's what we would do. Um, I do agree with everyone up here though that we have to involve the community, we have to involve the staff, and we have to make sure it works for everyone and especially the students. So, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, to Nathan's point, um, I hope you start seeing some differences between the candidates here. I think you'll notice that I'm a straight shooter and I answer the question, no, I would not support the ninth grade today in our declining uh, en enrollment situation. However, um, should we get into the situation where our, our enrollment is, is increasing, that would, be, that would be the goal. Is uh, we currently use, our declining enrollment today is, is, is typically attributed to declining birth rates. However, that's only about one third of the picture. Two thirds of the picture is, is parents taking their kids to other options within the community. And so bringing those parents back so that we really have growth in our, in our, in our school systems. And then we have problems that we have too many students in our, kid, in our schools, that would be a great problem to solve. Mm -hmm. um, my, my option would be to potentially look at two high schools uh, should we get in that situation. But I think it first starts with answering the question, why do we have declining enrollment? Um, and why do we keep having to bundle these uh, students that we currently have into, into less and less buildings that we currently have? And that's the problem we really need to start working on. Thank you. Karen? Difficult to answer it differently because everybody has made good, good comments on how are some of the objective way in which to be able to look at it. I agree with everything everybody said, except for um, an area that Education is so important, and we also have to think about the emotional uh, beings of these uh, kids at their age that they're at and such. Which way is the best way in which to go for them? We have such a problem with uh, bullying and different uh, things going on right now that if we do a lot of these changes, what can happen? There are some pros and cons with it. You can look at it from another angle with it also, as in maybe that would help them better if they're down and such. So when it comes back down to it, uh, it is a superintendent type of a decision that can be made with the help of the school board in which to come up with a discerned decision on it. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's, I think it's fun to be the last one to talk about this issue, but anyway, uh, you know, education is key. And I wanna remind everybody that education is key. I don't make any of my decisions uh, on the board based on declining enrollment or not. I make my decisions based on what's good for the student. That is the key that we have definitely to work hard for. Uh, when I voted yes to move sixth grade to elementary schools, I voted yes because Data and statistics, for someone like me who teaches statistics, and I believe in data, 
is telling me that by keeping the students in sixth grade in elementary schools, that will eliminate almost half of their social problems when they move into middle schools. That was the reason why I voted yes on that. When the superintendent in the future bring this issue to the board, remember, the superintendent will give us only recommendations and the, po the board job is to make the policy to make those kind of decisions. So as a school board member, based on data, based on information, and based on everything that is in front of me, I will definitely make that appropriate decisions at that point. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> the next question, we'll start with Mike, and it says, even before the events of last week, some of the behaviors and language at the high school have been extremely offensive and unacceptable. This is a reflection on the school district and the community as a whole. What action should the school board take to remedy the situation? And I'll just say it one more time to make sure everyone clear, clears it. Even before the events of last week, some of the behaviors and language at the high school have been extremely offensive and unacceptable. This is a reflection on the school district and the community as a whole. What action should the school board take to remedy the situation? Again, um, this is difficult to say while I'm sitting up here because it, I don't think that this is something that the board should do directly. That that's, if it's, a, if it's an action that happens in a school, that's your administration. That's your teachers. Now, from a board standpoint, if we need to put together a policy that says this is what happens with language or this is what happens, the, the policies that we write from a board standpoint, the what's brought to us with the data saying, again, these guys are exactly right. I believe exactly what they're saying is that we have to make informed decisions. We have to do what, what is right based off of those, the information that we have. Um, and I'm not trying to skirt the idea again. I was, a, I was in the hallways and that's what happened. What I tried to do, I walked out into the hallway as an administrator. We talked about it at every administrative meeting. We talked about it with our staff at that time. Get out into the hallways. Don't ever turn your head. Don't accept it one time. If you hear it, address it immediately. That's what we tried to do. And I think that, I don't think that this is a, that's a board issue that we're talking about unless it's writing policy to tell our administrators and our teachers what to do. And I don't know that I'm fully supportive of that because I think that the, the teachers and administrators can solve that personally, that's my belief. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that each individual school has their own issues with behavioral and uh, verbal out outbursts. And uh, there is a policy though in the district that a behavioral policy uh, for bullying and harassment. And each school needs to follow that, that uh, specific policy. And uh, if it's a bullying issue, then they need to take, take information down for both the person doing the bullying and also the target of the bully and find out exactly what's going on. And that's in the policy and we have, it's, uh, it's on the website um, for verbal and behavioral issues, the principal needs to be the forefront for that. Um, and they need to have discipline, set, discipline uh, action set forth for that. Um, they shouldn't have, a, shouldn't have a student that swears at a teacher or has a verbal outburst or has a uh, behavioral outburst leave, the, leave the, the classroom, be sent to the office and then before the end of the period be sent back to the class. I mean, there has to be some kind of de-escalation period. And uh, again, that's up to each individual uh, principal and disciplinary action. And that's not really board policy unless it's brought to us by the superintendent to create a board a behavioral policy for that. Thank you. Ricky? Yes, so when the events that happened a few weeks ago did happen, uh, there was quite an uproar within the community for good reason. Uh, one thing I did do was go and, and read the policy because that's what the school board does. I knew I was running for this position and I wanted to see what that policy was to see if it was being followed. And um, there, it is a general rule to be followed and 
unfortunately, people want to see immediate uh, maybe discipline or action. And sometimes things take longer to, to process. Sometimes it's a lot more clear. But um, as far as policy-wise, I think we need, always need to look at things. And maybe instead of look at what the anti-bullying policy is, try to drill down a little bit deeper and, and see what kind of discipline students receive in the classrooms. If we can hopefully manage the disciplines within the classrooms, students can have more respect for the teachers, for other students. And if they know there's, there's going to be a consequence for minor infractions within the classrooms, hopefully we can help curtail a lot of the bullying. There's always going to be bullying too, so um, hopefully we can help reduce that and limit it to as much as we can. Thank you. Mary? Thank you. So um, last week with the events that occurred, um, I understand that there were several uh, chat rooms within Muscatine that had um, the videos playing and smartly enough those chat rooms closed those videos down. And I think that that's what has to happen. I think that our community has to rally and support um, our students and say we don't want this behavior just like everybody said within the school yes there are policies uh, the administrators uh, the teachers work to support the students and enforce those policies however um, we as board members got a letter last week from a parent who wanted to know okay we had this supposed gun event how am i what am i supposed to say to my student and so I think preparing ourselves as the adults in the community and talking about this more will help us, all of us, together. So um, I think it's a, a, somebody said maybe parent forums or community forums, but maybe there's some discussion that needs to happen as a community of what we're going to accept and what we're not going to accept. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Sure. The question was, you know, what action should the board take? I think the first one is ask how we can help ask the administration, ask the school administrators, the staff, how, how as a school board do we help you with this? Because obviously it's something that's not only impacting our community and impacts other communities. And so first is just help. As a parent, I had two students at the high school last week when this all happened. And they were texting me during the day. I was getting texts from parents asking what was going on in the morning. I, I, it, the phone was sort of blowing up a little bit. So my first was just to listen to them to make sure that I was addressing what the administration had already said, making sure I was repeating the facts and not perpetrating any, you know, sort of rumors or anything like that. I told my kids they were safe where they were and that the staff and the community and the police officers that were there on campus were there to protect them. And so it was really my feeling that we needed to just help the superintendent, help the principal, and really just provide any feedback that we could that allowed them to handle that situation. After it's over, I think we need to look at the procedures and policies that were followed during that process, both the bullying and the gun incident and, the, and those. And then we need to make sure that we have some recommendations on how to improve those things going forward. And then make sure that we change the policy if we need to, to impact how it would happen in the future. I think the community, our society is changing at a pretty rapid pace and we have to be flexible enough to make sure that our policies stay up to date with that. So. Thank you, Jeff. I might speak a little bit as a frustrated parent on this one, so apologize for that, but um, instead of a candidate, but I think the first thing this board needs to do is take responsibility. The buck needs to stop with the board. This, you know, this, all we do is set policy thing is, is confusing as a parent. The buck needs to stop with somebody. The buck needs to stop with the principals at each school when there's something going on at the schools. And ultimately, if there's something going on at all the schools, the buck stops with the board. The superintendent reports to the board, the superintendent gets the reviews, pay raises, all of everything through the board. And so that superintendent reports to the board. And then all the principals report to the superintendent. And there's a, there's, there's a chain of command of this. And, and, I, and, I, and I never really hear that uh, ownership and responsibility about where does the buck stop as a parent. And so that's the first thing we do is start stepping up and owning the responsibility for these things. All right, thank you, Karen. Thank you. 
just so you know, the student handbook is 42 pages long. In that handbook, underneath the student area, there is uh, education opportunities, anti-bullying harassment with administrative procedures, civil rights grievance procedures. It doesn't really address what those needs are for it. I will tell you that there is a, I believe there is a disconnect from what this policy says. This is good policy. It's some excellent information, but a high school kid is going to take and read this 42 page information, not as well as they should. Now, let me be clear. It was violence. Both instances was violence. Mm -hmm. Now, should that be taken care of by the police department, the school system, and the parents? Of course but let it play out in the sense that it needs to be able to play out. It's unfortunate because of the amount of panic that happened with that. I'm a real stickler for timelines, uh, as a former colleague would tell. I have a tendency to find out when things happen, facts, when do they line up, and facts. And a lot of the panic that happened was people were thinking that this or that and everything happened. I'm gonna read a statement to you. Everything you do is based on the choices you make. It is not your parents, your past relationships, your job, the economy, the weather, an argument, or your age that is to blame. It's you, period. Okay, thank you. John? Yeah, uh, you know, it is very sad that we, as a society, have to deal with issues like that, especially in an educational institution for example, a school or a college and so on. Uh, as Erin mentioned, uh, I, I, I do agree with what Erin said. You know, as a school board members, we get updates uh, continuously from our superintendent on issues like that. Sometimes because we are asked not to say much because the police is investigating an issue usually ties our hands, sometimes as a school board. And we might look like, oh, well, they're not doing anything. But I want to assure you that as a school board member, I will work very hard to definitely, what I will say, uh, to have no place for any bullying in our schools. And to provide everyone, students, teachers, staff, principals, everyone in each of our building, what I call a safe environment, because they do deserve that. They do deserve a, a, an environment like that. So what I would like to say that, you know, the board has that policy. Yes, whether, whether, whether it's communicated to the students or not, as you mentioned, Karen, that's a different issue. But we have to make sure that every student oh. know, okay, every student know what's in this 42 pages. All thank right. you. Thank you. Nathan? Thank you, Jackie. I spent the better part of last week holding and comforting my nine-year-old daughter because she'd been sexually harassed by a fellow student in her class on Roblox, which is a game that kids play. So I understand the bullying problem. And that's not something a board can do a lot about. But I'll tell you what we can all do about it. If you go on Facebook and you look at what happened in the aftermath of these things, you see a lot of bullying. You see a lot of name calling. So maybe we can set an example and be adults so that our kids have something to look up to. As for what the board should do about safety issues, let me tell you what I did do. I believe that there are three things that we have to work on in terms of safety. Preparation, communication, and prevention. In terms of preparation, we need more security in the schools. What did I do as soon as I heard about that? I reached out to the chief law enforcement officer in the county, whom I know and whom I've, I've worked with on other issues, and I said to him, what can we do to get more officers in the schools? What can we do to increase the security presence? And he told me you know, that we have a lot of options. In terms of communication, I asked the uh, board secretary for our communication plan. Let me read that to you in the event of a disaster. Timely and effective communication is critical to an effective response and recovery. Direction on communication may be found at the Muscatine Community School District Office. That's our communication plan. Folks, it sucks. 
we need a communication plan so that people aren't freaking out, wondering or not whether or not their kid is going to get shot. And this is something that I pledge to do, to encourage and, and mandate that the superintendent do. And finally, we need to prosecute. I also reached out to the county attorney to see what we can do to prevent the sickness, or to deal with the sickness, and we need to provide mental health so that it doesn't happen in the first place, and that is something I've worked toward as well. All right, thank you. So the next question is, well, we'll start with Dennis. Please explain what you are doing or will do to ensure students are prepared for the next step in their careers. Please explain what you are doing or will do to ensure students are prepared for the next steps in their careers. Well, I think that uh, the school district, I believe, is doing a, a good job with that. Um, providing the ACT, ACT testing with, for the juniors. Every junior has that opportunity to take that ACT test with uh, the school district paying for it. They're paying for um, advanced placement testing. One thing I do think that we do need is we need to have more emphasis on our, on our technology classes, um, and our industrial technology classes, our ag classes, our um, home ec classes, or those types of things. Those, those classes that, that are important for life skills. You know, not everybody is college bound. So I think that we need to have some, some kind of voc tech emphasis for those kids that are not college bound. That's what I would emphasize um, if I become a board member, so. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, I, I love this question. I am actively doing this with my children. I've got two great examples. I've got a child that has several disabilities has an extensive IEP plan. She's deaf blind, doesn't have her balance, has a heart defect that causes fatigue. And she has so many, uh, she has so many aids around her, um, being an interpreter, having a device bringing the screen to her. And, and with all of her disabilities, my wife and I have been able to help her get the, the support around her that she needs, that she is thriving in class. And, and the deaf blind or the deaf and hard of hearing group is amazing in this community. My hope is to take what we've done, or not we, but what they've done with deaf and hard of hearing and, and make sure it's happening throughout special education. The other side is gifted and talented. I greatly desire to try to figure out how to create a fast track for children, students that want to learn that extend beyond their grade level. We have so much technology today through whether video conferencing or anything. If a student is thriving in a subject, encourage them to move on, but yet they're not probably thriving in every subject. So encourage them to move on from that subject. I have a great desire to help in this, to make our kids prepared for the future. Thank you. Mary? So prepared for your career, if you're a preschool student, um, you maybe should be aware of the LENA program, which is in our community, which is an early literacy program. And it's making those kinds of programs known and available to parents in the community. Um, it's uh, hiring the best teachers because uh, if you have a good reading teacher or you have someone that does well in math and can communicate that to the students, can teach, then those students are going to be very prepared for um, the basic education. We um, have started our ACT program, so all juniors take the ACT. That's assessing where you're at and how, how you're growing. Um, our district AP program has grown tremendously and we are a district of distinction, so we should continue that. And as uh, Ricky said, you know, he used pretty good language here. We need to fast track as many kids as we can. So um, your career 
can be seen pretty broadly. It can be the basics for some kids and for some others it can be specialized, whether in areas like agriculture or industrial tech or just heading on to a four-year institution um, quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Thank you. I think the seeds of a career start before school even. I think it starts at the home. I think it starts with the parents and their, their ability to sort of excite the children about what comes next. And then I think it starts in preschool and I think the Early Learning Childhood Center is a great step for that in the community. But I think we have to make sure that the students are really attending school. I think absenteeism is a real issue and it carries forward into their careers. If you look at even the, the, the employers around the area, they'll tell you that that's one of their issues. And that starts in elementary school, in preschool, and it starts with the parents. And so how do we engage them? How do we engage the students to make sure that they want to come to school and that they want to learn and that they know the future is anything they want it to be? I think the district's done a great job eliminating the financial barriers for a lot of those things. It was already mentioned about the ACT tests, the AP tests, all those things. Any financial need is sort of eliminated in the school district given our financial strength. I think if we can eliminate those barriers, get children excited about it, make sure that they want to attend school, I think they'll have successful careers. Thank All right, you. thank you. Jeff? I think this is an area where Mustine Schools has, it has a lot of promise and is doing, opening up a lot of doors for folks. Um, I, really, I really like what's happening with special education. I like what's happening with the advanced and uh, uh, the, the students that are taking the advanced classes. And I like the pilot program that's being starting, started in partnership with uh, the community college and where a, a, a student can graduate from high school with a two-year degree in the trades. And I think, I think there's a lot of excellent things that are starting, that are happening, um, and a lot of doors are being opened. I, um, I'm really, uh, I'll be honest, I'm, at, I'm kind of at a loss what, what more uh, Mustang schools could do in this area, but keep these doors open, uh, fast track the, the uh, partnership with community college on uh, uh, kids being able to graduate with a, a degree in the trades. Um, there's, there's nothing better than what's going on here. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Remember I said earlier, knowledge is power. And it definitely is here when you talk about what we want to do for these kids to get them ready in which to go. I was actually family self-sufficiency coordinator for a long period of time, and I got to see the barriers up close and to be able to work with different community members to find all those different places. Quick one for you. Years ago, it used to be called GED. So if somebody did not finish high school, they went for a GED. But then when the high school had to up their curriculum, why? Because the colleges wanted the people graduating to be ready to go. That meant GED could not stay where they were at. They had to go higher. So I can guarantee that I help folks that had to go from that transition area of it itself. We have teachers that have, they said, adequate time for collaboration in a study that was back in 2015 here from Dinah, says 36% disagree that they didn't have an adequate time. The teachers did not have an adequate time. Kids, my teachers take time to get to know me. That most of them were almost 50% was either neutral or disagreed on that. We have to take and work together in which to make sure that this is going to work much, much better for these teachers. Why? Because I know there's a lot of teachers. I see even in this room that I know that they care about what's going on with the kids. Mm -hmm. But there's actually more that may not have that same passion anymore. So what we need to do on that. We talk about the STEM, STEAM, making sure you put the arts in there, not just the STEM. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, uh, not everybody has to be an engineer or a doctor. We need a plumber, we need electrician, we need carpenters and all that. So yes, I would like always to see a strong relationship between Muscatine School District and MCC. Working on different uh, or creating different academies for those students who would like to become a carpenter or electrician or a plumber or whatsoever, so that they we will open that door in front of those students to move forward, get a degree in this field, and succeed in life. That's one thing I would like to see more and more of it. The other thing is uh, obviously you cannot raise a kid by yourself. It takes the community to raise kids right now. So I would like to see more uh, involvement from different 
community organizations working together to come up with a way that will help our students to move forward and become successful. But one thing also I would like to see, knowing uh, the, how the educational system works and being in education all my life, as a student all the way till now as a teacher, I would like to see students having some free time during the day. <laughs> I don't want them to move from one topic to another, one topic to another. I want to have some time for them to be creative and to shine Thank because you. creativity is going to make them succeed in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Nathan? Well, thank you, Jackie. So uh, rather than expound in great detail, I'd rather just give you a bullet point of things we have done and things we are continuing to do. First, we need data tracking because we don't genuinely uh, track what happens to our kids after they leave the high school. We need to know what happens to them so we can know how to do it better. We need to make sure that we have rigor in the academic environment so that we have kids who actually are able to graduate doing something, not having to take a remedial class when they get to college. One of the most important things we can do is mate our educational system to the jobs that are available in the community. Welding and other technical positions are immediately in demand and we can funnel kids who are interested in those fields there. We need to make sure that the 20% of the kids in our schools who have undiagnosed, undiagnosed mental health issues are able to access care. We don't want to provide the care, but thanks to the work that we have done in the last several years and the work that the county has done, we have been able to place mental health navigators within the schools so kids can get the help they need. Now let me tell you what I've done in the last month or so. I've spoken with corporate leaders trying to arrange for internships, job shadowing, and other externship programs. I've met uh, with uh, the superintendent and business leaders trying to push the uh, idea of an independent, or excuse me, of an alternative school that can address the needs of kids who aren't having their needs traditionally met. Um, I've gone around fundraising for a study and uh, raising money for possible facilities of, an, uh, of a, an alternative school. I've been to Farm Bureau to talk with them about what sort of needs they face. I've met with a local CEO to encourage him and his uh, folks to live in the community. These are all things that we need to do. Thank you. And Mike. And again, I'm going to come back to <laughs> parents are the primary educators of their kids. Um, they're going to make the decisions on what they think is best for their kids. So what do we need to do? We need to educate our parents a little bit quicker. I had four kids go through and graduate Muscatine High School. Not all of them played school really well. One of the things I can tell you, when the first one went to college, it was an eye-opening thing for me, and I played school well. My parents, I came from a, an educational my dad was an assistant principal for the school forever. My mom was part of the school system. So I can't imagine what it's like for people that don't have the same background I had, and it was eye-opening for me. So we need to educate our parents just a little bit better. What, I, I, the other part that I think that we need to jump on, um, and maybe we won't like this, but the proficiency that we read about is not the same as college ready. Just because our kids are proficient right now that's the, that's the lowest level that we can have for our students. That means that they, they meet a certain level or a certain standard, but that's not, it doesn't mean that they're college ready. The worst thing that we can do is have a kid or a parents or families believe that they are college ready, send them off, they acquire debt, as I told you, trillions of dollars worth of student debt is what we have right now in this country, and then they have nothing to show for that. That's the worst thing that we can do. So, Educating our parents about all the options and all the, whether it's a two-year or four-year school, we need to educate our kids, or educate our parents so that they can make informed decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> this next question, we'll start with Ricky. And these are a kind of a combination of two questions in the same um, content. Do you see a place to continue the support of the fine arts such as orchestra and choir as necessary, and should it have more focus than sports? Repeating, do you see that the continuation of the fine arts such as orchestra and choir as necessary, and should it have more focus than sports? I would easily say 100% yes. Orchestra, choir, band, any even any type of that thespian type of environment is essential and absolutely not should it be more important than sports. There are several different types of people. 
there are athletic people, there are people that are gifted in the musics. We need to provide opportunities for, for all the students, encourage them to do what they love to do, and whatever they choose will build leadership. And, and I believe we just spent a million dollars on the orchestra program buying new instruments. And my son was a recipient of one of those brand new violas and, and he's loving the orchestra and he's not participating in the sports. I'm supporting him in the, in the orchestra. And, but if my other children wanna play sports, I'm gonna support them in that. So I think equally, they are all important and by no means should one take precedent over the other. Thank you, Mary. So the question is, do you see a place to continue the fine arts? Well, I think that as Ricky said, you know, the school district is very supportive of the orchestra program. And yes, there was over a million dollars in investment of new um, instruments for the band and the orchestra. As far as is that more important than something else, um, there's different strokes for different folks. So, you know, whatever your interest or your expertise is, we should be trying to um, fulfill that uh, need for those, that particular individual. So, no, sports uh, plays an important role um, for a lot of kids, as does music and the fine arts, including uh, art as well. So, um, yes, we should continue our focus. Thank you. Aaron? Yes, I I'm going to say the same thing as Mary. I, I, think, I think it should be supported as much as sports. I think they should be equal. I even like what John said about offering them creativity. And I think students are creative in athletic ways. I think they're creative in artistic ways. And I think we just want to fuel that passion. We, I talked earlier about making sure kids are excited to come to school, making sure they know there's a reason there and they have fun while they're there. These are the things that do that. These music programs, these athletic programs, uh, being able to participate in a group sport, those things will help develop these children as much as the education they receive from us. So it's vitally important. I think we've seen great success. I was just looking back at some slides from a previous board meeting and, and attend, or, um, participation in the music department at the high school has doubled in the last couple of years. I, I think we can't help but continue that. We can't help but support all of our students' interests in those things. Thank you. Jeff? I support what the school is currently doing in these areas. Um, I think. Uh, I think I read one more, if I could be a little mistaken in my details, but I think I read one where, where we've got like the state's largest band, high school band or something like that. And, um, and I don't see any reason to stop those things. Um, I certainly don't want to hold one over the other when it comes to these. Uh, however, I do have one area where, where I do think we need to have more focus and start making it a priority and it's our academics. Um, and specifically, in, the, in those fringe areas. Like I said, the academics are working well for about 75% of our kids, um, but there, is, there are some kids the, that um, uh, the unique learners are the groups that, that we need to that face, that give us a unique challenge, and I think we need to give that a priority to be able to get uh, Mustang schools to be the best in our area. Okay, thank you. Karen? My daughter once told me it was my fault because she ended up doing art history in college. <laughs> and that was because I always took her to museums when she was little. She's right, I did, quite a bit. And I also have been, for 30 years, I have been part of masters and other theater groups. So it helped me in a lot of different ways. I also actually played fast pitch softball and uh, was a catcher. And so I got to see everything in a game to see how everything looked. Those skills carry over into your job situation that ever you are in. Now I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> pardon me, about STEM and STEAM, because now I'm very excited at the fact that they put STEAM, which means they put art in there, that it's not just about the STEM, it's not just about the science and math, that they are including the art area in there. We have Leader in Me through Stephen Covey that actually he even talks about some of that area too, about the arts and how that helps folks. We have at-risk kids, special needs kids, behavioral kids, any number of those kind of ones that might be able to take advantage of some of those things that you would not necessarily normally think that they would want to be able to do. I think it's important that every one of those becomes important to that child. 
Thank, Thank you. you. John? Yeah, you know, I would like to start with uh, by saying this, no one size fits all. Uh, you know, we know that. Uh, we learned that since we are kids. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of that board that voted to spend over $1 million on the, on the band and the orchestra ad because we see the importance of providing our student with those opportunities. Whether it's the, the fine art, band, orchestra, uh, uh, sport, uh, the academics is very important too. We want them to have a complete experience. And to have a complete experience, you need to try everything. You know, I'm very proud of my two kids. They are fifth grade, and they started to play trumpets now. Uh, obviously, they started to do, you know, sounds now, but I'm very happy that they are doing this, and I'm hoping that if they continue, they will be part of the band, the school band, when they are in high school. So we need, as parents also, forget about us as school board, as parents, we need to encourage our, our kids to get involved, because by belonging to a group like that, first of all, you create friendship with others that will help you also achieve what you like to achieve, and they will help you with that. Uh, it, our school board and our school system provide instruments to anybody who wants those instruments. So, uh, so that's something that I would like to share too. Thank you. Thank you. Nathan? Thank you, Jackie. When I started high school, I was a chubby, short kid with big hair. And I, then I joined the speech and debate program, and that, I think, was uh, very formative for me. And now I'm a chubby, tall guy with no hair. So uh, a couple things changed, but maybe not the chubby. So um, I don't know that activities would, would necessarily have helped me with that because I wasn't a sports guy. But absolutely, both of these, uh, both sets of activities are incredibly vital. Um, a friend of mine who uh, recently moved to the community, uh, she was widowed uh, her husband died suddenly at a young age, and her two uh, children basically went into shell um, until one of them here joined uh, one of the fine arts programs and was given an outlet for his creativity. And uh, I'm sure most of you have seen him. I'm not going to not going to say names, but the transformation is incredible. And anything that does that for a kid, we got to focus on. But that can happen in sports. That can happen in uh, the theater. That can happen in speech and debate. And what we need to realize is that for some kids, some kids who are struggling to hang on, maybe they have a bad family situation, maybe they have a lot of other challenges that we don't see, that activity might be the only reason they're staying in school. So yes, we have to prioritize those. We need to do more to remove any barriers like we did with the orchestra, but to remove barriers so the kids from every socioeconomic background can get into these valuable activities. You wanna talk about career readiness? Get them there and they're gonna be ready for life. Thank you. Mike? This might seem like it's in my wheelhouse. I spent the last, I spent nine years as an activities director. Um, so uh, yes, 100% keep kids in extracurricular activities. Nathan is exactly right. That's why, that's, that's how we keep them involved. We know that them being involved with a school is gonna keep them safer. The most dangerous time for a kid um, is from three o'clock to five o'clock at night. And so keeping them involved in our school that's what we need to do. Any way that we can overcome those barriers, whether it's they have childcare at home with, with their own siblings, or whether it's that they can't afford to do something, we have to be able to do that. Uh, any ex extracurricular, excuse me, any extracurricular is gonna help with time management, which is gonna be something that they're gonna need when they move on. And it, the teamwork, the collaboration, you just can't overcome any of that. Um, I can't say enough about, and I am fairly passionate about any type of activity. I think that our, our music department would say that uh, they got great support from me, at least I hope I, they would. I, I did try to help them get a million dollars worth of equipment, <laughs> so I think that that was, was great. Uh, I will tell you that the one thing that I, that in my experience that I liked the most or that I was most impressed with was when I was an athletic director at l and and on a Friday night football game, I would see a kid peel off his jersey, peel off his pads, run over and grab his saxophone and be able to play. I think that's one thing that we have to be able to do at the 4A level is figure out how to share kids. Thank you. Dennis. 
I, I totally agree that uh, all extracurricular activities need to be emphasized equally. Um, we have a great orchestra, we have a great band program, we have a uh, great uh, vocal music program, uh, as well as our athletic, athletic teams are, are expiring. Um, as a previous coach, I always try to encourage my players to get involved in other activities, whether it be uh, the band, orchestra, vocal music, or whatever, or another activity in uh, the athletic realm. Because I really believe that sports and um, orchestra, band, chorus, they, cre they give you life skills. They help you um, trans or aspire to be something different than what you maybe thought you were going to be. And they give you skills that translate into the workplace. And I think that every, anything you can do uh, to encourage kids to participate in those extracurricular activities is a plus. And another aspect is that one thing, if they're involved in a extracurricular activity, it creates a ready-made social group for them. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes them feel wanted. And hopefully we can continue to do that with our student body. Thank you. In lieu of time, we will take these next two questions. They're kind of survey questions, yes or no. So we're just going to have you raise your hand if it's a yes and assume if it's a no or you abstain, you'll keep your hand down. So first question is, if you have children, are they or were they enrolled in the public school system? Yes or no. The next question is, should school district employees have their children enrolled in the public school system? Okay. Time for audience questions has expired. Interested members of the audience can contact their candidates at any time and get more um, information, and we'll have a little bit of time after the closing statements. Closing statements from each can candidate will have one minute and then I will have a few statements to end our time together. And we will start with Mary. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and those in the audience and those watching on television, uh, particularly the League of Win Women Voters for always presenting these forums to the community and educating us about the candidates and the issues. I encourage everyone to vote this year. Voting is such an important part uh, important for the individual, our school district, our community, and our world. I would appreciate your endorsement on November 5th. Thank you for listening tonight. Thank you. Aaron? Sure. Thanks again, Jackie, and thanks to the League of Women Voters. I would encourage you as well to vote. Um, I, I believe we have a very critical time coming with the curriculum audit that we're finishing up and the hiring of the new superintendent. And I think we need good board members that represent the entire community in a very collaborative and innovative way. And I would look for your support for that. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff? I, uh, I agree with Aaron. This is a critical time. Uh, five seats are up, up for grabs this election. Um, there'll be a new superintendent coming. And so for the, at least for the next roughly four years and beyond, uh, the faces that are elected here in this election will be guiding the school system for a, a reasonable time to come. Uh, I'm the candidate for uh, the, the students that are unique out there, the unique learners out there. I'm not uh, frustrated parents and for teachers that don't feel supported. Thank you. Karen? Thank you, Jackie, and the League of Women Voters, and of course our audience here tonight. Over 30 years ago, I received a scholarship by someone who believed in me and wished to participate in Leadership Muscatine in its second year. It was quite the learning experience about everything Muscatine. That included a model, school board, and budget that we had to work on. I remember that. And in fact, I just kind of had a funny feeling someday I would need that information. So here I am. It is important to note that there are many topics tonight that we may have immediate solutions for and may not have solutions for. But I encourage to see our collective willingness here as candidates to try to go for those solutions. We gotta remember that there are some School is a real struggle. For others, despite of their upbringing, they excel. We need to work with all the kids. It is their future, not ours. And remember, knowledge is power. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yeah, uh, I would like to start by thanking you, Jackie, and the League of Women Voters for giving us the opportunity to talk 
about a dear issue to my heart, which is education. As I always say, education is key. Um, uh, investing in our kids' future is definitely a key. And because of my experience all my life in education, and I'm still currently involved with education as, um, as an instructor at MCC, uh, I would like to ask for your vote on November 5th or before if you decide to vote early. <laughs> and the reason why I'm asking for your vote because John Beat stands for quality education. And John Beat stands for uh, what I call moving our district forward to next step. Thank, Thank you. you. Nathan? Thanks, Jackie. Every single person up here tonight is passionate about education and wants the best for our kids. Every single person in the audience, whether you're up there, down here, or at home, you're passionate. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So you've got to look for more than passion. You're going to have people who want that. But what you have to look for is not just ideas, but you have to look for action. Who has worked to uh, advocate on behalf of students? Who has worked to connect them with the services that they need, the opportunities they need? These are the questions you need to ask yourself. And uh, when you do, you need to ask yourself also, who is an independent voice? If you look at the minutes for the last six months or a year, I think I'm the only one who's ever voted no in any motion on the school board over that period of time. I was kind of struck by that the other day. But uh, I'm an independent voice because I've probably ticked most of you off at some point, And if I haven't, just wait. I'll get there. Um, but you need to uh, uh, assess who's going to provide the best action and uh, not simply look at ideas, but who's going to provide the results, demand the results, and get the best for our children. Thank you. Mike? As I stated earlier, I recently retired from Muscatine Community School District. Uh, during that time with the district, or during my time with the district, I had a great pleasure of working with some good and, and possibly great people. I am, am and will be proud to be a Muskie. I'll always be a Muskie. Uh, the world around us is rapidly changing, and I truly believe that it's going to take a village and that would include our, our city council, our chamber of commerce, and our school board working together to create a vision that will help our kids. Um, I'm, willing to work, I'm, I'm willing to welcome or I welcome the opportunity to, to serve the village. I, I guess that's how I want to end it. Thank, thank you. you again for having me tonight. Dennis? All right, I'd like to thank Jackie and the League of Women Voters for having this forum. Um, I have a vision for Muscatine Community School District and that is to have classrooms where students and teachers are inspired with the learning that's taking place. I envision a school district where teachers have a voice in what happens in their classrooms, their schools, and at the district level. I hope to see children who can't wait to get to school because of what's going on. Uh, the day is gonna be filled with learning that is fun, exciting, and challenging. My goal is a simple goal, and that's to it would be to listen to teachers, parents, and administrators, and students, and to serve with their best interests in mind. That's why I'm asking for you to vote for me on November 4th, November 5th. Don't vote November 4th, unless you're in an absentee vote. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Ricky? Yes, um, thank you to everyone. I am excited to be running for school board. Um, I, as I was getting signatures, people were asking if I was crazy. I don't know yet, but <laughs> I, I have a great desire to be on the school board, like Nathan said, all of us do. I have been an advocate for my children as they've been growing up. They've had a lot of needs. I've been trying to keep up with them, and I hope to provide that same advocacy to all the students. And so my hope is that we'll be able to fit this curriculum to the students and not the students to the curriculum. I, I know the students and the teachers all want to learn and help the students learn. So vote and, and I appreciate all your support so far. Thank you. Mary? I did already. Let me do it again. We're going back around. I was the last one. <laughs> that was a quick, I was, okay. <laughs> well, I appreciate all of y'all. I appreciate, um, let's give another round to our candidates. Thank you, audience here. Thank you, audience at, the, at other venues that you're viewing from. Thank you, league um, members who've come out to volunteer your time tonight. We would also like to thank the city of Muscatine for providing space. 
the Muscatine Community School District, and Muscatine Power and Water Digital TV, and MCC make the TV viewing possible. Tonight's program will be rebroadcast on Civic TV Channel 2702 for the next several weeks. We hope to upload tonight's forum to YouTube. I appreciate the technical support of Jeremy Ferguson and the supervision of Chad Bishop. The League of Women Voters will be hosting a Municipal Candidates Forum on Tuesday, October 8th, 2019 in these chambers starting at 7 p.m. We invite you all to come back out, bring a friend and a neighbor with you. Um, if you'd like more information about the Muscatine County League, please talk with any league member or our esteemed president, Sue Johansson. A reminder that today, while the few hours we have left, it is National Voter Registration Day, and our league is participating with leagues across the country to register voters. If you or someone you know has not registered, please encourage them because their voice is very important. Election Day, reminder, is Tuesday, November the 5th. For the purposes of electing the five members of the Muscatine Community School Board and the city municipal officials, the polls will open up at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. I encourage everyone to vote. Thank you and good night.